This really has been an exciting week if you've been following along in our daily Bible reading program. Uh, the book of Mark comes to an amazing conclusion. And for me, it really begins in chapter 11 when Jesus and his disciples now for the third year, Jesus returns to Jerusalem and this time he comes in triumph. You remember that story as he comes around the mountain and, and they bring a young colt for him to, to ride on. They spread their coats in front of him. They tear down the palm branches and make a carpet for Christ to enter again into the temple. The first thing that he does is he cleans out the temple of all the graft that is there, the excesses. He changes it back from a den of robbers into a, a house of prayer. And Jesus begins to teach. And when he does that, we can use our sanctified imaginations this morning to think about when Jesus enters into the temple, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the heart of the aristocracy is there. The high priest and his minions are there. The Romans are, are looking from the fortress Antonia down on the temple. When Jesus is there with all of his followers, and the first thing that happens, the high priest come to Jesus and say, who gave you permission to do this? Uh, we might say in modern parlance, you didn't fill out the proper permits. We don't have the papers on record yet. And Jesus says, all right, we're going to talk about a war of words here. You have a question for me? I'll answer your question if you answer my question. And we can just see the high priest stroking his beard. And Jesus says, the baptism of John the Baptist, was it from God or was it something that John made up? Is it from men? And the high priest gets together with this council and, and they're thinking about this. You see, the, the rabbis, the teachers were really, really, really good at asking questions and stroking their beards. And so they say, if we say it's from God, then he'll say, then why weren't you baptized? But if we say it's just something that men made up, the people will stone us because all the people believed in John the Baptist and they were baptized. And, and so the high priest goes back and says, oh, we don't have an answer for your question. And Jesus says, well, we made a bargain and I don't have an answer for your question either. That must have ruffled some feathers. Jesus goes on to teach, but they come back with another question. And this one is really, really tricky. They come to Jesus and they say, Lord, we know that you're a good teacher. And then they, they really butter him up and, and then say, now, we've got a question. <clears throat> should we pay taxes? Now, if we were going to take a vote, who votes that we should pay taxes today? That's not the most popular. Oh, back in, okay, all right, Ben, you've got a fine young man there. All right. We're not excited about paying taxes. Well, in the first century, it was even worse because the taxes went to the Romans, who were an army of occupation. So think about it. If Jesus would have stroked his beard, if he says, no, we shouldn't pay taxes, that would please the people, but the Romans would have an excuse to take care of Jesus. And, and you know, it's a very, very tricky question. And so Jesus thinks for a moment, he says, uh, bring me a coin. Let me take a look at this thing that you're, we're talking about this morning. And they bring him a coin. Can you see the face of the... Uh, actually, that's Alexander the Great. That's a Greek coin. But, uh, and he, Jesus holds it up and he asks the people a question this time. He says, uh, whose face and whose inscription is on this coin? And the people cry out, Caesar! And Jesus says, well, then give what belongs to Caesar to Caesar and what belongs to God to God. Oh, man, what a classic, classic response. Okay, so the Pharisees, they had their shot. They asked their best question. Along come the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees, remember the Sadducees because they are sad, you see, because they do not believe in life after death. 
They do not believe in angels. They don't believe in any of that spiritual stuff. They think that when you're dead, it's over. Kind of like most people in our community do today. They might hope for life after death, but they really don't know. And they just, it's a blank question. And the Sadducees have thought of a really good way to word it. They say, oh, now, Lord, a certain man had a wife, and he died. And he was the oldest of seven brothers. And according to the Levitical laws, the younger brother was to take the widow and to have a child with the widow so that the older brother's name and his fortune would, would continue. But the younger brother died too. And so a third brother marries the wife, and he dies. And a fourth brother marries the wife, and he dies. I'm beginning to think that she is bad luck, aren't you? And so forth. All seven are married to this woman, and all seven of them die. Now, this is a question I'm sure that we've all asked. When we go to heaven, will we still be married? I mean, if your husband or your wife has already gone before you, are we going to be single again? Are we going to be married? What's the, what's the relationship there? You see, the Sadducees, they've got this thing worked out. Now, how's Jesus going to get out of this one? And Jesus doesn't waste any time with us. You guys are wrong. God is not the God of the dead, but he is the Lord of the living. Yes, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he talks about them as if they are still alive. And he says, you don't know the scriptures. And in heaven, we're not going to be married. And get, the world is going to be completely different. It will be totally glorious. It will be so awesome when we get there. We're not going to be worrying about you know, who's kissing who when we get to heaven. And so he shuts down the Sadducees. And along comes a sincere scribe. Now, scribes are kind of like lawyers. And he asks a question, which is the greatest commandment? Now, that's a good question. Let's read the scriptures together now. And one of the scribes came up and heard him disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind and with all of your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you're right, teacher. Well, that's kind of amazing, isn't it? Jesus was right. And you think about that question, but it's a sincere observation. You're right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Think about where he was standing when he made this observation. You can smell the smoke from the great altar and the sacrifices that are there. And this scribe even recognizes all of this is just for show in comparison. And when Jesus saw he had answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. I can hardly wait to get to heaven and find out who this guy was and what's the rest of the story. Did he go on to become a disciple? There are a lot of questions we're going to have to wait till we get to heaven to answer. But this was a great question. You see, in just the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, what the Jewish people call the Torah, there are six hundred and thirteen commandments. Shall we name them together? That's a lot. It covers every aspect of life. We remember the Ten Commandments, don't we? You know, the first four talking about 
the Lord. There's only one Lord. And, and the last six talking about how we, we treat one another. But there's 613 commandments. Uh, the Jewish people looked at it and said there are 365 thou shalt nots. One for every day of the year. And what is it, 214, something like that, uh, are the remaining commandments. One for every bone in the human body of thou shalt. That's a lot to remember. And it's even more complicated than that. Because the Jewish people were so sincere about keeping the commandments that they even made commandments to go around the commandments. It's kind of like my grandmother saying, don't go near the water till you know how to swim. How are you going to learn how to swim if you don't go near the water, Grandma? Doesn't matter. You're not going to drown if you don't go near the water. We do a lot of that. The Jewish people did that all the time. The fourth commandment is to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. How do you keep the Sabbath holy? Well, it says, thou shalt not work on the Sabbath. And so we stroke our beards and we ask the question, well, what is work? I'm not making this stuff up, by the way. What is work? Um, tying a knot was classified as work. Well, stroke your beard, ask another question. What's a knot? Well, it's not a knot if you can tie it with one hand. So it's okay to tie knots with one hand, but if you have to use two hands, you can't do it on the Sabbath day because that's work. Now, it gets, it gets into some really strange stuff. I'm not, I'm not making this up. For example, if a chicken lays an egg on the Sabbath... That's work, right? The chicken violated the Sabbath. Can you eat the egg anyway? The answer they came up with, yes, you can eat the egg, but you must kill the chicken. All right. Uh, you want to go back to knots? Now, um, drawing water, taking the water up out of the well, all right? that's, that's work. Well, no, it's, it's not considered work because you have to drink in order to live. But uh, what about if there's not a bucket on the rope? Well, we already touched that. You can't tie a knot on the Sabbath. Oh, well, stroke your beard. Women, in order to be modest, must fasten their undergarments and wear undergarments on the Sabbath day. So it's okay to tie knots in a lady's girdle on the Sabbath. That's right and proper. Therefore, if the bucket is not tied to the rope on the well, if you take a girdle and you tie the girdle to the rope and the other part of the girdle to the bucket, then you can draw water. It's okay that way. No wonder he says, okay, Lord, can you give me an answer? What's the greatest commandment? The, the rabbis used to have a contest. Can you tell me the law standing on one leg? All right, that was the big challenge for the rabbis. Jesus says, all right, I'll tell you the greatest commandment. Let's look at it together because it's just as valid today. It's called the Shema. Shema is the Hebrew word for hear, listen. And that's how this phrase begins. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all of thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 and 5 in the King James Version. That's the Shema. A good Jewish man, in fact, they, they said when a Jewish boy can learn to speak, the first thing that he should speak is the Shema. And that a good Jew, the last words on his lips when he dies should be the Shema. And you pray the Shema twice a day. And on the Sabbath day, it's incorporated several times during the synagogue service. This is vital. This is the essence of our relationship with God. It begins with there is one Lord. What does that mean? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our Lord is one Lord. Well, in Hebrew, that can be interpreted a couple of different ways. We could say there is one Lord, there's no one else like him. He is unique, and that's true. We believe that there is only one God. When I was wandering around in the streets of Singapore a couple of years ago, I came into little India. And in little India, they have a world-famous Hindu temple complete with, with Hindu priests, these 
big guys. They, they don't wear shirts, and uh, I mean, boy, they're bad-looking guys. But the temple itself is a mountain of gods, all standing on top of each other, reaching up into the sky, and it's it mostly reminded me of something you'd find at Disneyland. But they have all of these gods. The Shema says there is only one God. Not all these demons and demigods. There is one God. Now we need to use that in our lives. This is a very practical thing to say. There is one God. We have one purpose in our life. God isn't of two minds. You know, the Zoroastrians believe that there are two gods, a good one and an evil one, and they're wrestling. They're constantly fighting. And when the bad one is winning, then bad things happen in the world. And the Russians march into Ukraine. But if the good one is winning, then good things happen in the world. And we have bumper crops and all. But the, the two gods are equal, and they're constantly fighting. No. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. God is one, and we need to be one. Do you remember the story of Lot's wife? You remember uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? And Lot and his family were warned, get out. God is going to destroy Sodom. Rain down fire from heaven. And Lot's wife, she's divided she wants to stay in Sodom. She's got a nice house. She's just finished decorating. You know, she's got new drapes in the living room in China. It's all set. It looks really good. She's got some good friends that come over on Tuesdays and, and play cards. I, I'm making that stuff up. All right. But she wanted to stay in one of the most advanced cities in the ancient world. She wanted to live there. But on the other hand, she didn't want to be burned up in fire and brimstone either. She wanted to escape, and, and so as they're leaving the city, she sees the hills, she sees salvation, and she wants to be saved, but her heart is still attached to Sodom, and, and, and so she's, she's torn between two desires. And when she looks back, what happens? She's turned into a pillar of salt. Why are so many Christians unhappy? Because they're two minds. They want to be with the Lord forever, unimaginable glory and joy and peace. It's all. But I'd kind of like to watch the Super Bowl this afternoon. And I'm sorry, I'm not a big basketball fan, so I, I don't follow along. Um, I'm just checking to see if anybody's actually listening to the sermon this morning, all right? Okay, just, just give me that. We need to be wholly focused on the Lord. One Lord, God is not only unique, but He is the only Lord is the way that that can also be translated. And so we need to be like the Lord and be focused. You know, you can't do much with a flashlight except shine the light, right? But if we take that light and we focus it as a laser, it can cut steel. We need to find focus. We need to believe that the Lord is one and so we are one. But then Jesus goes on and he says, love the Lord with all of your heart. Now, the Hebrew word for heart here describes all the stuff that's inside. You know, the ancient Greeks uh, talked about that man has kidneys. We say that man has heart. All of those organs inside are important. And when one of them starts acting up, we are in serious trouble. We need everything that is inside of us. And everything that is inside of us needs to be devoted to loving the Lord. But it's not just our heart. It's also our soul. And in, in Hebrew, <coughs> this is talking about our whole person our whole person. We love the Lord inside and out. But did you notice that Jesus changed the Shema a little bit? He didn't quote Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5 exactly. He added a fourth element, not just with 
what's inside and what's outside, but Jesus also says, with your intellect. Christians are often pictured as being naive, of being simpletons, but Jesus says Christians love God not only with their heart, their emotion, not only with our hands serving him, but also with our intellect. God gave us a brain, and he expects us to use it and to love the Lord with it and to see God in the order that is in our universe. And finally, with all of our strength. I was translating it this week in, in Hebrew, and the, the word strength isn't what we would think of, you know, strong muscles and all of that. It's multitude. Multitude? With everything with all of our energy, with all of our passion, with our emotions, with all that we are. In other words, inside, outside, all around, we love God completely. We don't keep little closets and little corners of our life set aside for ourselves. We are completely devoted to God. But Jesus says it doesn't end there. The second commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, are you ready? Stroke that rabbinic beard. Well, those of you who have them, feel free to go ahead and stroke your beard as we ask another question. And who is my neighbor? Well, in the parallel account, we've been looking at Mark, but the parallel account in Luke, a man did just that and says, and uh, Lord, uh, talking to Jesus, who is my neighbor? I mean, I understand, you know, my next door neighbor. I understand the members of my synagogue. I understand the members of my congregation. But uh, what, about, what about those Gentiles? In fact, one rabbi, I'm, I'm not making this up, was asked, Rabbi, why did God make all these Gentiles? And the rabbi stroked his beard and says, to feed the fires of hell. They're simply fodder. They're simply fuel for the fire. Who is my neighbor? And so Jesus tells one of the most wonderful parables. He talks about a, a man who had to get to Jerusalem. He's down in Jericho, 3,000 feet below Jerusalem, down in, in the valley by the Jordan River. And he's got to go up this narrow canyon, a dangerous pathway to get home. We don't know why. Maybe there was a disaster at home. Maybe his wife was ill. Maybe their child had fallen. Maybe there was something going on. But he had to get there, and he didn't wait to go with the convoy. He went by himself. And this is dangerous country because it's easy to set up an ambush there. It's one of those spooky places. But he goes anyway. For whatever the reason, maybe he was just simply foolish and didn't want to pay to go with the convoy. Maybe he didn't you know, he didn't want to be burdened by anybody else. We don't know why, but he found himself alone in that canyon, and the worst happened. He was mugged. He was robbed. He was beaten. He was stripped. He was left for dead. And he didn't have a cell phone with him. And he's laying there. And along comes a priest. And the priest sees the man laying there. Now, if the man was dead and the priest went near him, then he would be contaminated and not able to go and, uh, and serve in Jerusalem. See, there were so many priests in those days that the typical priest lived in a village and went to Jerusalem for two weeks out of the year to serve. But if he got contaminated by a dead man, then he'd miss his year's duty. Maybe. So the priest gives him a wide berth and goes on. Along comes a Levite. The Levites are kind of like assistant priests. They do all the jobs in the temple. And he sees the man there, and he goes by on the other side too. He's not going to stop and help him. And we could even see this poor man. How would you feel if, if you were laying there and you slowly feel your life ebbing out? Everything has gone wrong. You hear the sound of someone coming. Yes, hope, salvation. 
But the man goes away and leaves him there in the dirt. But along comes a third man. This man isn't a Jew. He's not a Gentile. He's not a Roman. He is a Samaritan. Now, you can't really say Samaritan without spitting because these were half-breed Jews. These were the scum of the earth. These were the, the, the Jewish people. If they thought that the Gentiles were fuel for the fires of hell, the, the Samaritans were even worse. But the Samaritan sees this poor man. And he stops, and we all know the rest of the story. He gave him first aid. He put him on his, his beast of burden, his donkey, he leads him to the nearest inn, takes care of him that night. When he has to leave in the morning, he gives the innkeeper money. Take care of this guy. And if he spends more than this, if he, if he orders room service, when I come back, I'll take care of it. And then Jesus concludes by saying, all right, of these three guys, who was the neighbor? The Samaritan. So when Jesus says the greatest command is to love the Lord, and because we love the Lord, the second command is love one another. Tomorrow is Valentine's Day. Woo! Paper hearts. Love it. It's a celebration of love. But we celebrate a love that is so much deeper, so much greater. A love that is eternal. The aged Apostle John, the last surviving apostle before he died, said, little children, love one another. And so as we leave the assembly today, let's celebrate love the way that God intended. Let's stand and sing this next hymn.